Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Just uh, just me today. Donovan is off on another job, and he's left me with my blank slate to start on the interior finishes. So I'm pretty excited to kind of get started transforming this uh, stark empty box into something that looks like a home. Should be interesting. Today, we're gonna get started on the flooring. So what we decided to do was a white oak rifts on floor and I'll get more into the grain patterns and everything in this video as we start processing the flooring. But this is the kind of look of the, uh, the white oak rifts on. So on the end, we have the growth rings oriented as sort of an angle here to the face. A flat sawn board with the cathedrals would have the growth rings oriented kind of parallel to the face and quarter sawn would have them oriented pretty well perpendicular to the face. So the floor is actually gonna be the only thing in the whole space that is like a wood grain finish. Everything else is either stone or painted. So the floor is really going to be a uh, kind of a big highlight of the space. Having all that stuff, the other things painted, really allows the floor to shine. So I'm trying to make a pretty ridiculously awesome looking floor. Uh, <laughs> and I'm excited for that. So uh, yeah. So to give you an idea of where things are going moving forward, here is sort of a look at our uh, palette of things. So we have the flooring sample. We have the backsplash. This is the countertop. That is a stone that we selected. So it's got kind of a bluish kind of undertone. And then this is the color sample for the trim and cabinets. So really the focal point of the space is gonna be the floors and the countertops. And uh, there's still a lot of stuff to make. So I did make flooring before <laughs> and I will, uh, We'll get into that as this video progresses. Uh, and I'll, I'll share some of the things I did last time that I'm gonna do a little bit differently this time. Because last time I did a floor, I said I would never do it again. And here we are. <laughs> so for those of you who have seen that video and remember that one, in that video, I did a room that was 325 square feet. And how that compares to this space, that is essentially from this wall to the pantry is the size of that room that I did last time. And with the Southern Edition on the back, that's another roughly 300 square feet or so. So the total area I'm trying to cover in here is going to be 650 square feet. So roughly double what it did last time. It's kind of weird to think that the family room of the old house was just up to here. So we have this additional space here to do as well. So let's, uh, let's go take a look at some wood, I think. So under this tarp here is the lumber that I picked up to make all this flooring out of. It is roughly 1,500 board feet. There's probably a little more than that there. So that should put a pretty good dent in uh, getting enough boards to make the flooring for in the house. So you can see this is all just uh, plain sawn, flat sawn, round the mill, so we'll be able to pull our floorboards out of all these pieces and get what we're looking for. So essentially today I'm going to start going through this pile and ripping uh, the strips I need out of all these pieces, trying to get the grain orientation exactly where I want it, and I'll share more of that as we start digging into this pile. But it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good sized pile. So a couple more things before we get started. Uh, we didn't cover upstairs the actual final plank width. That sample was six inches, so we're thinking somewhere between five and six. It's really gonna depend on sort of where the, the narrowest boards are in here and what the pile ends up looking like. One thing I did last time when I made flooring was I did the full width, and then if I had some that were pretty close, I did a second run of a little bit narrower width, and then I can mix those in and that was a little bit, way, a little bit better way to uh, utilize the material kind of as you went, because this does create quite a lot of waste and it's kind of annoying when you have a board that's like a half inch too narrow to become a full width piece. 
as long as you keep track of which ones are narrower and you don't screw it up during the installation, it's not a big deal. You can kind of mix those in, those rows in that are a little bit narrower, and you can't really tell once it's installed. So I'll probably have a couple piles going as we get into it. Now, one more thing with this is this was cut last fall. So I bought this from a friend who cut all this last fall. It's been air drying on stickers. So that's uh, well, about nine or 10 months or so. So it's about as dry as it's gonna get out here. So we'll need uh, a bit of final drying as well. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do right now is whittle this pile down into the pieces that actually I'm gonna use so that I'm not drying material that's just gonna go end up in the, the scrap pile. One other thing I can do with the scraps, it technically is scrap for this project, but I can also use those pieces for um, other projects or if, or if I want to do the drawer boxes for the cabinets out of white oak, I can use those offcuts, make them into panels and make all the drawer boxes out of those. So I'm not really worried about like throwing away too much of this. And lastly, no, this is, this is a lot. Right now I'm just doing the, the central area of the house where we've been doing the addition. The existing 1960s first floor of the house is gonna get hardwood as well. Um, we'll probably still run white oak through the rest of the house. That's another 800 square feet. I don't know if we're gonna do riffs on through the whole first floor or just riffs on the kitchen and then I can do like a random uh, green orientation to the rest of the house. Haven't decided yet, but things that kick out of this pile will end up being used elsewhere. So <laughs> here is a piece that is gonna be riffs on through the, the whole width of it. You can see that it has some pretty straight grain, really nice looking stuff. This piece here is what I will kick aside. This piece is quarter sawn, and you can see the actual medullary rays in here, which is kind of not what I'm going for. Now, one last thing <laughs> is the area that I'm doing, there's a good chunk of it that's gonna be covered by stuff eventually, so I don't really care what the actual flooring is under those areas. So for instance here, this whole area through here, that's underneath the cabinets or the stove. This area here is underneath cabinets or a fridge. The island sits, sits right here, so that's underneath the island. This area is gonna be covered by the breakfast nook bench thing. So I don't care that these areas here are rifts on. They can be any green orientation just to kind of get rid of them. Also there's a cabinet here too. So there's a lot of areas that are gonna get covered up anyway. So I don't care how those areas look but I do care about everything flowing through here, especially. Okay, so wish me luck. There's the pile, there's the table saw. I'm gonna get to ripping and get my pile set up and we'll see, we'll see how this goes.
It might not look like it, but there's a pretty good dent in this pile now, which is good. Still a lot left. I'm actually pretty surprised uh, how good a yield I'm getting. I haven't really rejected much boards and the trimmings I'm having are pretty small. This is a pile of trimmings that are worth anything or have any significant width still to them. And I have the really thin trimmings over there. And these are my selects. So these are, uh, I'm ripping these at six and three eighths. They'll give me an eighth of an inch off of each side for edging. And you have a little extra there and I should be able to get six inch wide uh, floorboards out of this. This pile over here, these are gonna be about five inches or so. So these would probably yield some four inch-ish wide boards. I did have some pieces right out of the stack as the camp the saw that are about, uh, these are like four and three quarter wide and their uh, rifts on are looking pretty close to it. So I will probably do a run of narrower ones that I can mix in with these or maybe the pantry has narrower strips or something. Regardless, <laughs> bonus pieces, pieces I actually want. So I thought I would show a few different examples here with a different grain orientations to help uh, maybe illustrate a little better what I'm going for for those that don't aren't super familiar with different grain uh, orientations. So this one over here is going to be a plain sawn or flat sawn. You can see you have all of these cathedral patterns, all these, you know, wood grain looking things. <laughs> so you got all those going on in there. This one here, this is quarter sawn. So this one you can see all of the ray flex. These are the medullary rays of the tree, the rays that go from the center of the tree out to the outside and carry nutrients in and out versus the growth, the grain, which goes up and down, which carries things up and down the tree. This one here is rift sawn. So fairly similar to quarter sawn as far as the uh, sort of grain lines go. They are straight all the way down, but they don't have the ray fleck exposed in the surface. And then again, with the flat sawn, you don't have straight grain lines all the way down. You have all of these sort of scoopy patterns. Looking down here on the end, we'll show you all of the, uh, the magic of identifying these things. So the growth rings are going to tell you exactly what's going to happen on the surface. So down here, this is our flats on planes on board. You can see the growth rings are kind of running sort of parallel to the face and anywhere that is perfectly parallel to the face is where you're going to see those scooby patterns. Also interesting here is you can see that the way the growth rings shift as you get out here due to the curvature of the tree, you get more straighter grain. So this area right here is going to be a rift sawn orientation. So you can see that one's got the growth rings at a little bit of an angle to the face and that's going to produce straight grain without showing those medullary rays. Down here is the quarter sawn one. You can see the growth rings are running pretty much straight up and down. They're hitting this face uh, pretty much perpendicularly, so you're going to get the exposure of the medullary rays on the surface. And if you look real close, see these lines that are running uh, horizontally right now? Those are the medullary rays, and as that ray hits the surface, there it is right there. So you can see how it extends. So that's what all these little line things are. They're the rays inside of here getting filleted open <laughs> and shown on the surface. So quarter sawn white oak is nice. I personally don't like too much of it though. I think this is way too busy to have a whole floor like this. It's not my thing. Uh, even whole pieces of quarter sawn white oak furniture feels like too much for me. I like the quarter sawn ray fleck as an accent, not as the overall focal point. So for me, having something that's gonna be more rift sawn, so you have straight grain, not really busy, versus a plain sawn with all the cathedrals, I like this a lot better. It gives me the look of this without these. <laughs> and depending on how the boards get cut, you might have a little bit of hints of ray fleck because you're going to have the most ray fleck when those growth rings are the most perpendicular. But if they're off by just a little bit, you'll have some ray fleck, but they won't be these giant blob things. So as I'm working through this pile, I'm basically just looking at the end grain, trying to pick out what section of the board is going to be the most riffs on. So this guy here, you can kind of see, I have my circular saw because 
easier to see the growth rings if I clean cut some of this. But this has the growth rings running like this. And as you get over here, you start getting into like a full curve. So it's kind of curving like this and like this. And then as you get to this side, they get more diagonal because the curve would have continued up over here. So this section over here is going to be a rift sawn and then it's going to transition into a plane sawn section. This isn't wide enough to get a full uh, floorboard out of here. That's going to be totally rift sawn. So this one I will probably be rejecting. Yeah, so this is a little too much cathedral action. So this one goes into the reject pile. Okay, progress report. <laughs> Getting there. So there are the uh, full, the full six-inch pieces. I got some uh, the five-inch pieces here. I'm getting down there, which is super nice. I got maybe this last uh, quarter to a third of the stack left. This little pile here is my my reject pile of plain sawn boards. And what I'm doing with uh, this pile, I probably should organize this a little bit better, but I got reject two quarter sawn boards and then uh, strips that are still kind of wide enough to do something out of. Uh, so this is like, this would be a good size for like a drawer box for a drawer side or something. But uh, definitely getting down there. I'm kind of worried I'm not going to have enough though. Because... <laughs> What was interesting is when I started at the top of the pile, almost every single board ended up in this pile. And now I feel like I'm rejecting like every single board and finding one every now and then that's good. So we're get, we, we are getting there. If these end up at actually a six inch finish width, since they are eight feet long, every single one of these cover uh, four square feet. So I need uh, 160. I think that's the math boards like this, which is 32 stacks of five. And uh, I'm maybe halfway there. <laughs> so uh, might need some more. We got, I got these, but that's not, that's not a whole lot. So I don't know how many more boards I got. I have here still to go, but I think I'm, I'm making good progress. This feels pretty good. We got a good sawdust pile happening here on the table saw. It's uh. It's good to make in sawdust again. Okay, I think, I think that's it. Uh, what time is it? Almost five. So I started at 11, had a break for lunch, so well, almost six hours. I enjoyed it. This is, for me, pushing wood through a table saw for six hours is a dream. So uh, here is the stack of six inch boards. That is pretty darn close to what I need. I think when you add the 
the four inch pieces onto there. This should be pretty darn close to enough. Here are the uh, flats on boards, which I just completely rejected. There's not enough width in there to get a piece of riffs on out of. This is boards that are like two perfectly quarter sawn. Like look at the giant ray fleck on, uh, on this one. This has got some giant ray fleck. Don't want that. <laughs> and we got some narrower stuff. So I'll have plenty of material to use uh, for drawer boxes for the kitchen if I want to make those out of white oak. Hello there. Things are a little different. <laughs> It's been uh, three months since I did that initial uh, sort and select. It's, uh, it's November, happy November. In the meantime, uh, I've been doing this. So uh, this thing exists now. <laughs> and uh, now that that's kind of done-ish, done enough, I can get back to doing the house stuff. So uh, I'm going to just get back to the flooring here and uh, take this stuff for final drawing. So we're going to be taking the, uh, the white oak here over to my buddy Eric's and running it through his vacuum kiln. Since these don't have much moisture in them, it should only take a couple of days, maybe three days in this kiln to get these down from wherever they are right now. Probably 12 or something down to like six to eight or something. So not, uh, not too long. We'll get a moisture reading when we're at the kiln loading and everything. So I got the, the actual flooring I selected here. I've got the pile of uh, extra stuff. The kiln's a thousand board feet. It needs to be completely filled. So I'll take that pile and then take some of this so we have enough to completely fill and run one full load. So there's that bundle of flooring, still uh, still in a bundle. Somehow didn't spill completely out. <laughs> and uh, starting to get some of this extra stuff loaded up here next. I think that might be enough. I don't really know. <laughs> I'm hoping to have more than is needed because it's better than having not enough. I don't know, maybe I'll just toss the rest of these on there and just call it good. I don't know. All right, we're gonna drop the kids off at school and then go straight to Eric's. Hi, okay, we're through the drop off line with a trailer full of wood. Let's, uh, let's go to Eric's. <laughs> the looks I get. Back at uh, Eric's kiln again. So, uh, what video was that? That was the workbench kits. We did a little a whole discussion on Eric's machine and how it's been working and all of that. Uh, so, but a quick little summary. We got a box here that the wood goes into. There are these plates here that go in between the stacks of wood. A vacuum is applied to the entire uh, chamber that lowers the boiling point of water, allowing us to boil off all the moisture in the wood, essentially. And these little plates allow us to heat the wood while it's in there with no air. That's the that's your basic synopsis. <laughs> the other really cool thing with this is we got the the lid, which is a rubber membrane. So when the vacuum is applied, it collapses and presses the whole stack down, smushes everything, keeps it dead flat, and that is, at least to me the game changer part of this whole thing. That is the game. <laughs> so hopefully we have, I think I brought enough. I think we'll make it. So we're gonna fill it up real quick here. We're gonna do uh, three, three rows. Yep, triple stacking. We're triple stacking the wood because- It's so air dried already. We only got two days worth of work here. So yeah, we just tested it and got like 14. Yeah, 14. So, and then how long do you think is it gonna take? Year. 48 hours really <laughs> but i'll putz around because it's the holiday weekend so i won't be going wild but if i needed it dry it'd be out of here yeah that, that's why i'm here today is because it's thanksgiving weekend and eric doesn't want to work
So because Eric wants to uh, play around and experiment, <laughs> uh, we have one less plate up here, and then the rest of the plates are down there. So instead of you know picking one up and bringing it over, because we're going to need one plate at least, we're going to attempt to fill this whole thing up, which will be, I don't know, like 12 layers? Yeah, probably eight. You think eight? Yeah, maybe 10. We already got four in there already. We're going to double her up and see what happens. <laughs> so we'll be at uh, eight rows between plates. So what that is going to do is the further from the plate you get, the less heat there's going to be. So the, the stuff kind of in the middle of here is probably going to end up a little wetter in theory, which means you got to run the machine longer to pull that moisture out. So Eric wants to see like how far from the place he can get <laughs> and, and, and test that out because, you know, he's looking for something to do on his vacation week. It's science week in China. <laughs> <laughs> but actually this is a, a very good time to point out one, or I guess point out one thing and answer one question that, you know, we've talked about over the years and that is why slabs cost more than lumber if it's less work to make slabs. And one of the things I point to with slab production is the inefficiency of space with slabs. So you can see with edged lumber, that's like, that's packed in there. Oh, yeah, like right you have no wasted space in the kiln. So regardless of how full or empty the kiln is, it still costs the same amount to run it. So the more board foot you can get in here in the box, the lower per board foot the drying is. So with slabs, you don't have this uniformity kind of thing. So your cost on drying, at least, is higher. That's one of those things with uh, why slabs cost more than boards that we've talked about in the past. Yeah, okay. All right, I'll give you the honors. Put that sucker down. Well, it's a little chilly. The wood's cold. Everything else is cold, so Eric's gonna get things heated up. I'm gonna take off and we'll come back and hopefully your experiment worked and you didn't sink too much time into playing around. Okay, we're back. It's been, uh, it's been like two weeks. Is that that long? I think so because, okay. you know, vacations. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, you said something off. about how you wanted to, you know, take some time off. That's right. So. Thanks. <laughs> Did, uh, we're assuming your experiment worked with how many rows we put in here? Was it eight? The experiment worked five? great. Yeah, we did, what was it, seven? Was there one, two, three, four, five? Was there seven? I think so, something like that. It was a lot. So we had a few wet boards because someone didn't cover them. <laughs> someone properly. left them in the rain. Yeah, <laughs> so that didn't factor into my math. However, it it just took an extra little bit to, to once I knew that, then it took a little bit longer. <laughs> once, once you figured out why it's not working, you know, because Matt had a tarp blow off yeah, and didn't yeah. tell so me. You can see the water spots where it, it really, the water had soaked into those boards. So I had went across and retested them. So we're good now. And this meter reads, you know, if it's, if it's at 8%, it reads 11 on here because that's the way it's set up. So it's not reading high. You're at 5.4% on that board. Well, that's yeah, you're plenty just, good. Just plenty dry. Yeah. <laughs> you're good. You're good. So that how long, how many days did you run for? Uh, I ran it for four days. Four, four days. Exhausting <laughs> days, by the way. There are four exhausting days for you? You're... I forgot it was running on Thanksgiving. <laughs> that's how you spent your Thanksgiving, is running down and checking on the wood. Yep. All right, well, let's get it unloaded and Get it out of here. <laughs> Look at that. the That's the test. If it makes the right sound. If it tinks on this, it's dry. <laughs> Don't even need a meter. <laughs> Pro tip.
Okay, here's our pile, all loaded. It's time to head home. Empty. There is our stack of wood all dried and ready to be actually machined into flooring. And this brings me to the last little bit here, lessons learned from last time. So last time I made flooring, I jointed and planed all the boards into like blanks, and then I ran them through the table saw to make the tongue grooves. This time I want to use an actual molding machine to make these because that's uh, a little bit easier, a little faster to actually make, but more importantly, it should be more consistent. And that is the biggest kind of issue that I had last time. You know, running all the stuff through the machines, you know, bit by bit took some time, but it wasn't terrible. What was the, the worst part about it was when I got to the install. Because the setup on the table saw wasn't absolutely perfect, there was enough variability there, even with the feather boards, that the tongue and groove width and thickness or length or whatever could vary. So it was very rare that I could install an entire piece of flooring, one board of flooring onto that floor without having to tweak something, either tweak a shoulder or tweak the thickness of a tongue or something so that it all actually fit together and slid together because uh, it just wasn't perfect enough. And that's where all the time went and that's where all the frustration was. Running the boards through, through the shop, through that slower process, it wasn't, it wasn't horrible. It took hours, of course, but it wasn't that bad. It's kind of like just, you're just feeding wood through. But when you're sitting there on, on your hands and knees trying to get boards to actually slide together and seat, and you have to do that for every single board, and you have hundreds of boards to go through and do that on, that gets old fast, and I have no desire to do that again. <laughs> so I'm working on arranging a little more of an uh, elegant way of machining all of this stuff this time. So it should have pretty close to enough. We will uh, we'll see for sure as we get going, but at least this will put a huge dent in what uh, surface area I need to cover. So there it is. <laughs> so next time for this, we'll be turning into actual flooring that can be installed. And at the same time, I'll be working on getting the cabinets started too. So these will be kind of parallel streams. So that's all I'll be working on get the flooring ready to be installed and then installing it and then uh, you know starting uh, starting in on the cabinets and all that. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to making some sawdust again and uh, doing something else besides building this building. <laughs> so that is going to do it for this one. Thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the flooring and this barn or the house or whatever, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy working.